everyone. Welcome to The Daily Word. I'm really glad that you've joined me. And for our daily word, we're in the book of Exodus, chapter 21. And what I'd like to do is share verses 1 and 2. And then uh, let's talk just for a few minutes today about what I think we could describe as a, as a, a trajectory of, uh, of revelation and of, uh, of redemption. So if you would, hear the word of the Lord. These are the regulations you must present to Israel. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he may serve for no more than six years. Set him free in the seventh year, and he will owe you nothing for his freedom. Now, uh, it does, I think, it's fair to say, feel quite strange, and maybe even uh, a bit troubling to read in the Bible about regulations concerning slaves. Uh, particularly if this, you know, like if this is your first time reading through the Bible, through the Old Testament, uh, this can be a little, a little uh, disconcerting, right? Like why, why does the Bible not just across the board from beginning to end say, hey, slavery, don't do it, right? Um, and, and of course, this, this, is a, this is a fair question. And, and the unfortunate thing is that, that many have have misunderstood the Bible and have misrepresented the Bible and, and tried, to, tried to use things like this as a, as a way of undermining the authority of, of Scripture or even dismissing the Bible in, in total. And so, you know, part of what that looks like is to say, well, you know, this, there's a lot of culturally bound stuff in the Bible and the, the Bible uh, condones slavery and so the, the Bible really doesn't have moral authority on whatever I kind of pick and choose that the Bible doesn't have moral authority about. Uh, one of the, the biggest issues, uh, frankly, that, that this has been used in is the, the issue of sexuality. That, well, you know, that was culturally bound and, and those, those declarations that homosexuality, that that practice is a sin, that those those, those are culturally bound, just like the, this condoning of slavery and, and so forth. And, and then there are others who will just say that, that the, the Bible is, is bound in time and it's, and it's not true. And, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, there was an actor recently who, <laughs> who said that this is just an absurd statement. He, he, he said in an interview that the Bible is one of the worst books ever written. And um, he said, you know, because it, it induces people to believe things and, and that it's, it's mythology, it's this and that, and, and another thing. And that, that is, of course, of course, just nonsense because uh, the Bible actually produced the culture that this guy enjoys. I, I think his name's Brian Cox. And, um, and it, it was, uh, in re relation to slavery, it was actually Bible-believing Christians who uh, sought the abolition of, of slavery. And, 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 you know, just as a, for instance, in our church, we've gotten more and more involved in recovery ministry, and, and it is just a fact. This, this is just a, a, a demonstrable fact that, that recovery... Um, that, that recovery organizations that are faith-based, and let's be honest about it, specifically Christian that are biblically based, have an, an incredibly uh, much higher rate of success than, than any other programs, certainly than secular programs. And, and so, you know, to say that, oh yeah, the, the Bible that is foundational of Western culture, that, that uh, is, by the way, the, the most the most purchased book, the most popular book of all time. Um, I'm thinking a lot of people would disagree with this, uh, with this fellow and, and his assessment of, of the Bible. But all that being said, what do, what do we do with this when we, when we encounter something like this, like this, this statement about slavery and how you handle slavery? And, and what, what we, what we mi must see, and this is part of why we read the whole Bible, what we must see here is, uh, I think, what we could call a trajectory, an upward trajectory of, of revelation of who God is, of who we are, who God made us to be, of our purpose, 
And, and then not only of, of revelation, but also of, uh, of redemption. What we see in the Bible is that from the moment that humankind fell in sin, that we chose rebellion against God, and we broke relationship with God, we brought sin, rebellion, darkness into this world, we brought the curse of sin into this world and, and into humankind. From the moment that that happened, what we see in the Bible is that God is ministering and God is working for the redemption of, of humankind. Uh, as a matter of fact, we see uh, one of the early illusions and promises or prophecies about, about Jesus and his victory over sin and death and the enemy of our souls. We see that even in kind of the, the debrief after the fall. So this is in Genesis chapter 3 when, uh, when God is addressing the serpent, the tempter, Satan. And this is in verse 15. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And so the, the declaration here of the Lord is that that the offspring, uh, singular of, of Eve, which is pointing toward Jesus, that the serpent, that Satan will strike at his heel, will cause, will cause hurt, but that the offspring will strike, will crush his head. And, and so it is on the cross that Jesus Christ actually dealt the, 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 the victory blow over sin, death, evil, and the enemy uh, of our souls where Satan thought he was having one over on the Messiah, he was going to destroy the Messiah uh, by his death and resurrection. Actually, Jesus has won victory uh, for us. So we see that, that right away, and, and we understand then that the whole of the Bible is pointing toward Jesus. He is the pinnacle of the revelation of who God is. He is the, he is the work of redemption that the whole Bible is leading up to. It is redemption in Jesus Christ and, and our restoration to God's image, the image of God in which we are created. And, and so what we see then along the way are these sort of incremental ways in which God is working to redeem, to restore. And, and we, get, we get this trajectory in the Old Testament and Jesus quotes from, uh, from passages in the Old Testament related to this when, when Jesus is asked, what is, the, what is the greatest commandment? He says that it is, if we could just sum it up, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. To love God, to love people, right? And, and so that's, what, that's the trajectory of this redemption is that this is who we would become in the Lord. And, uh, and so we just read the Ten Commandments, so let's think about that. The Ten Commandments says you must not murder, right? You must not commit adultery. Now, um, I, I want to be clear that I am in favor <laughs> of these commandments, right? These are good things. Um, not killing, not committing adultery, yes, this, let's do that. Uh, th th this is good, right? But that is actually not... The, the end goal, that is not the fullness. Not, just not killing someone is not the full redemption, the full restoration, the full salvation that God has in mind for us. And so, you know, we hear Jesus in Matthew uh, 5, 17, say that he's not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And as you keep, as you keep reading in that passage, and I, I'll just, read a, a couple of verses here, starting at verse uh, 21, where Jesus says, You've heard that your ancestors told you, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. And in a similar way, it's in verse 27, you've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But, if, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see, the, 
the goal here is the transformation of the heart so that we just don't stop ourselves from killing people, but we actually love them. We love and forgive and work for the best for people, that we don't just not commit adultery, but we actually have a covenant with our eyes. We seek purity. We, we, we focus our affections on our, on our wives, our wives or, or ladies, on our husbands. And, and, and th- this is getting then, you, you know, you, you see this sense of trajectory uh, in, uh, in the scriptures in the redemption of humankind. And, and so in, in terms of slavery here, just to come back full circle to this, um, we see, first of all, that the slavery that, that we're reading about in Exodus is not what we tend to think of as slavery. This is really more of what you'd call indentured servanthood and, or servitude. And, and, the, um, and what we see here is that, that they're, they're essentially working off a debt and someone else could buy that debt and use your services as a, as a slave. Uh, but at the, the end of those six years and the seventh, seventh year, those debts were to be forgiven. And you see other kind of protections or rights for, uh, for slaves. But the ultimate goal is not just that slaves will be treated a little more fairly. The ultimate goal is actually freedom. Freedom for slaves in this sense, but freedom for all of us. For all of us are truly slaves to sin. And that, that is fulfilled, that is given, that is accomplished in Jesus Christ. In a sense, what I think we could say is that the gospel destroys slavery. The gospel destroys slavery. If we look uh, at the book of, of Philemon, it's a very short book. In, uh, in the New Testament. If you're looking for it, you go through uh, the, the letters of Paul, you get to Titus, it's the, the last one there, uh, Philemon. Um, Onesimus has run away. He is a slave of Philemon. He is he has run away and he has connected with Paul and he was helping Paul in ministry. Paul, it seems, led him uh, to faith. And what we see here in how Paul writes to, to, um, to Philemon is that, that the gospel destroys slavery. Listen to this. I wanted to keep him here with me while I am in these chains for preaching the good news, and he would have helped me on your behalf, but I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted you to, I wanted you to help because you were willing not because you were forced. It seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Uh, (laughs) With this declaration, there is no way that slavery could continue. It, it is ultimately destined to crumble because of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Slavery is incompatible entirely with the gospel for the gospel uh, is, is needed by all. We are all in the same position at the foot of the cross. We are all saved the same. It is all by the grace of Jesus. It is all by His merit. And so the ground, friends, is level at the foot of the cross. And Christ is bringing about a new humanity, a family of God. And so this is a brother in Christ, Paul declares. A brother cannot be a slave. And and I just just finish, friends, if if you'd allow me uh, just another minute. I know this is getting long, but William Wilberforce was uh, a strong Christian man in in Britain, and he was largely responsible for the abolition of slavery in Britain. He was influenced by, um, (laughs) who would have thunk it, uh, by a people called Methodists, uh, especially uh, George Whitfield, who was a famous evangelist. And and so he's an evangelical Christian. He's a Bible-believing Christian, he comes to, um, to be under the influence also of a spiritual mentor named John Newton. 
This man uh, was uh, a slave trader uh, himself. He came to Christ. He was called to be, uh, to be a pastor, and he wrote a hymn that I feel like you probably will be familiar with, uh, a hymn called Amazing Grace, right? And, and so it is by the, the gospel of Jesus Christ that this slave trader's heart was broken and softened and remade in the, in the image of Christ. And this life was redeemed, and that, that life touched the life of William Wilberforce, who, who advocated for the abolition of slavery because he believed the Bible, because he believed the gospel. And I want to close with this quote from William Wilberforce in relation to the Bible. Why is it so hard to get people to study the scriptures, he asks. Common sense tells us what revelation commands. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Search the scriptures. Be ready to give to everyone a reason of the hope that is in you. These are the words of the inspired writers. And these injunctions are confirmed by praising those who obey the admonition. And yet, for all that, we have the Bible in our houses. We are ignorant of its contents. No wonder that so many Christians know so little about what Christ actually taught. No wonder that they are so mistaken about the faith that they profess. You hear the commitment of this man to, to the Lord, to His Holy Word, and it causes him to work tirelessly and by the power of God for the abolition of slavery. Seems to me that the Declaration of the Bible being one of the worst books ever written, that that statement is probably the most backwards, upside down, and opposite statement that has ever been made. <laughs> so, so let's read the Bible, let's know what's in it, let's see the trajectory of salvation, let's see that the whole Bible points to Jesus Christ our Lord. In His name, amen. Amen. And friends, till we have a chance to speak again, I pray that God would bless you and that He would keep you.